wealthy and the self-made man. Some were eager to leave. Others forced themselves out of a sense of obligation. A few were truly beloved. Others lost their connection to us. And some still remain an enigma. But how well do we really understand the minds and hearts of these men who, for a brief time in history, we call Mr. President? I must admit I had a little help with it. There once was a president named George who wintered at Old Valley Forge. With Martha not there, he got nothing but air, and his member was put in cold storage. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson had a lot on the ball. He wrote the Declaration of Independence, but that was not all. He wanted things sim simple and walked to his inaugural and then back to the boarding house. He didn't want to enter the, the, the White House at that time. As a matter of fact, he called the White House. He, he named the White House because he didn't like the President's Palace, so he called it the President's House, but then it became the White House. My own oh, I know what I, he was dressed in, in shorts, you know, although it, I don't suppose they called him shorts in those days, but he thought everything was too formal. He didn't like this bowing, so he created the idea of shaking hands, a custom which is held down to the president. Is that right? Yeah, that's, what, that's what I read. His wife, his, his wife died when he was, when she was 33 years old, but he had about eight children. And he was the father of the first child born in the, in the White House. By her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He started that custom, too. <laughs> Descendants that any president ever had. And while in France, he developed a taste for, for their wine, as well as for women who went along with it. <laughs> instead of his song he made for it with the he like the party with Jeff instead of his song he played, he played the violin he, he was an architect of the first order as you all know he, he built his own home on the top of a hill overlooking a college which he designed for all the frills he, he was a he, as a, he, an inventor of many different things. The revolving door, a letter uh, copying device, a portable writing desk, automatic closing doors, which are still used today. Uh, the only thing he forgot was, uh, was the 20th century computer. 
<laughs> in spite of it all, he did so many things, created so many different things. But when he died, he was 40,000 in debt. And his, his grandson, James Madison Randolph, had to make, make up the, the deficit. We were in good hands then. Hands that built this country and his home. Hands that played violins, sketched temples, wrote the Declaration and letters by the tone. Mr. Jefferson believed that Indians were men from whom he could learn a thing or two. While president, he studied insects, small animals, kept a mockingbird, and often drew. Our capital, Monticello, the university. The plans he drew were grand and fine. He designed our money and our freedoms, wrote cookbooks, too. Loved lines. The man knew how to learn to study. He did it hours on end. The man knew how to love his family, country, friends. The man knew how to lead and to listen, how to think and play. I long for and I wonder where are such presidents today. Yeah. Sing you guys a song. It really made you sing tonight, so uh, <laughs> we had no, time with Jefferson, right? right? Now, just as on a serious note, this is the 250th anniversary of the birth of Thomas Jefferson this year. Today? And today this year, today? it is. Okay. Not today, evening, huh? <laughs> And in the early 1960s, John Kennedy had a dinner in the White House. I'm doing something for Greg Peterson here. And at the dinner, they honored like a dozen Nobel Prize winners. And John Kennedy gave the toast at the dinner and said, there has never been a collection of talent like this at the White House before in its entire history, except when Thomas Jefferson dined so I just want to give that little preamble. Oh. Oh. Okay, ready? Oh, this is a rap song. Who wrote that? Hold on. 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 Florida. 
and the Missouri Compromise, but was sure as hell penniless at the time of his demise. <laughs> Monroe, now he was the man in the office, he had the upper hand. And Monroe, he was so darn good, he scared off the entire neighborhood. He kept on feeding all their fears and ended up serving for four more years. That old man, he was a patriotic guy because he died on the 4th of July. A <laughs> wrap. <laughs>
Old Hickory was Prez Jackson's name. Strength of character gave him his fame. He stood loyal and true when folks made his wife blue in Irving Stone's tale of her game. Oh, that's good. <laughs> 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 I had William Henry Harrison, and he was only in office for 30 days. <laughs> Mine isn't anywhere around. His nickname was Old Tippecanoe, who checked out when he contracted the flu. <laughs> only 30 days as president, he was barely a resident of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. <laughs> Then into politics he did delve. He served Indiana as a governor and then in the House and Senate on the floor. He ran for president at 68. Some say he ran too late. When he went to his inauguration without a coat, his political rivals began to gloat. For this president caught the pneumonia germ and ended up with the shortest term. Tippy Canoe and Tyler, too, was his campaign cry. After taking office, he took only one month to die. <laughs> <laughs> he had a son named Je Benjamin who followed in his shoes. I guess he figured with bad luck like this, he had nothing to lose. <laughs> 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 Excellent. 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 Excellent.
Harris uh, statement about uh, about uh, that president's wife I had to mention. Let's listen. James Polk. What can I say about James K. Polk? He had a wife named Sarah. <laughs> they weren't exactly cheerful folk, even for their era. They were never known to take a drink, to dance, or tell a joke. They'd be shocked today, I think, about Bill Clinton's smoke. To Sarah, James was most devoted. They never were apart. Her influence was widely noted. She was schooled in the governing art. Some griped when she took a salary, and her policies were promoted. Some asked, like they might about Hillary, was it she for whom we voted? But these two were best in foreign affairs, where they never missed a beat. They annexed Texas fair and square, despite some Mexican heat. And best of all, with the victory run, James knew he was infirm. And like George Bush, he declined to run for more than just one term. trail to discover gold in a pail, the first postage stamp was founded while the guns of the Mexican War sounded. Polk was called prudent and farsighted, but only his wife Sarah was selected. Ah, that's great. David Atchison, Senator from Missouri, on March 4, 1849, became a footnote in presidential history. President Polk's term expired at noon on Sunday, March 4, 1849, President-elect Zachary Taylor, a religious man, informed the folks in Washington that he would not travel on Sunday. Here's the Davis Rice Atchison story. Oh, we're going to, to sing you a very sad <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
but others did the talking for old rough and ready. Oh. Zachary Taylor was an unhappy man. Now Polk knew that Taylor would be in for a fight. As president, he thought him unsuited. He was right. For though he got votes and he won the election, Zach wasn't ready for his chilly reception. In the North, the economy faced a recession. In the South, the slave states were seeking secession. Zachary Taylor was an unhappy man. Now Zachary developed some pretty good plans, but in only nine months it was out of his hands. He caught a bad cold and was sent to his bed. When they found him in the morning, Zach Taylor was dead. Oh. The fearless old general Zach Taylor was an unhappy man. <laughs> <laughs> the fearless old general, strange as it seems, died in the kitchen eating cherry ice cream. <laughs> Zachary Taylor was an <laughs> Now Zachary had bettered old Crockett and his gang and his band, for they had never won the highest office in the land. But now, years later, when memories fade, a more invidious comparison is made. Instead of in glory at the old Alamo. Poor Zachary Taylor died Alamolo. <laughs>
Although he was six feet tall and handsome of face, he lost the 1852 nomination, sending him back to Buffalo in disgrace. Franklin Pierce is number 14. <sighs> there once was a pres of great ranking who did say he had a hankering. <laughs> he would mess around, but then he found his wife with a knife would pierce Franklin. <laughs> his name was handsome Frank. He really was quite swank. Though his bid for Cuba failed, he nevertheless was hailed for obtaining a very high rank. Yeah. Franklin Pierce, with political ambitions unshared by his mate from New Hampshire in '36, for Congress had a date. In the ensuing years prior to 1852, two children they had who died quite young. <laughs> Jenny's distaste for politics grew alarmingly bad and made her extremely sad. A third child came and Franklin decided to quit politics and by his family abided. So he declined a post in Pope's administration, but deep down this was a terrible decision. Unbeknownst to Jenny, he continued the political game and was nominated on the Democratic ticket in 52 to initiate his fame. Culminating in a March 53 inauguration, after which in station, he had an altercation with an old lady over <laughs> which his horse had trod. <laughs> and he was saved from the jailhouse when his identity was discovered. Pierce's tenure was never a happy one, faced with the loss of his children and a non-caring, non-supportive, alienated wife that left his political and private life bordering on abject strife. <laughs> <laughs> this is terrific. The total opposite of Archive Pierce. The life of the 50s mash fame. I'm told that's where Alan Alda got his name. <laughs>
And so I said, well, in keeping the spirit of the things, I didn't fill out the questionnaire. If he'd have done nothing, that'd have been better than what he did. So I didn't do anything. <laughs> I didn't do anything. I didn't write a poem. Yvonne. Good introduction. Okay. There once was a president, James Buchanan. To most people, he was not very outstanding. <laughs> Good. Whoa. <laughs> that sounds... Okay, that's it as far as clever. Okay. <laughs> he hung a man named John Brown. This took place in Harper's Ferry Town. He was known as quite a bore. As we know, he helped to start a civil war. He was a bachelor, never to marry. You see, of women, he was quite wary. He thought that men should have their slaves, and in 1868, he took this opinion to his grave. Hanna was a Democrat. He was expelled from college because he was a brat. He moved us closer to the Civil War. He never married, but his niece was a whore. <laughs> number two, and you dare not say John who. For a while no hero, for a while no hero with the madams, this fellow named Adams was a true statesman through and through. With his missus named Abigail, their country they never did fail. He even beat Tom J, which was really quite okay, because four years hence with Tom J he would trail. <laughs> well, he'll never be seen as number one. He begot another Adams who won to also be a prexy, neither glitzy nor sexy, but an Adams, John Quincy, his son. All right. ...about being invited, so we started thinking about Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> Not much for crabbing. He was raised in a cabin. Journey miles to borrow books for learning, his future, you see, was now at the turning. While serving in the House, he debated against slavery. Republicans supported him for his cause of bravery. Next came the White House to further this cause. Then the Civil War was won, along with new laws. Alas, at Ford's Theater, he was shot in the head, but he will be remembered for courage, though now he is dead. As we have been told, it was his sad fate. But Honest Abe goes down in history as one of the great. For good, our 16th president did all he could to free the slaves, to win the war, to make men free forevermore. It was Honest Abe so tall he stood. All right. Okay. Yeah, one of those got there. Once it was whining. <laughs> I was determined I wasn't going to write the poems. So I went home last night and I uh, talked my kids into doing it. <laughs> Actually, I had to do the dishes for Emily. <laughs> I had to take care of Tracy's horse. And I had to play uh, table tennis with Mark. <laughs> but I did get four poems. <laughs>
don't think they understood the full meaning. <laughs> Lincoln's a great man. He wanted a big van. <laughs> a lot of deals didn't exist when he was president. For those that are interested, that was Dave's. <laughs> Honest Dave knew not, knew not color. Honest Dave knew no wrong. As he fought for equality, he listened to all. He helped build this nation as Abe never to fall. Not sure it rhymes, but... This is the final poem. Good. <laughs> The man he stood six foot four, no man was ever respected more. He taught himself to read and write, and then he stood to lead the fight. <laughs> to help the slaves, to set them free, instead of stringing them to a tree. <laughs> His country divided, <laughs> with brothers at war, he led to unite, so it suffered no more. And then the man who stood so tall, a bullet to his head did fall. Ulysses Simpson Grant, and if you might not have known when he, he was called Liss, especially when he was younger. Of course, my boy was born in a log cabin like all good presidents in 1832. Okay. <clears throat> Mediocre student, unsuccessful farmer, our Liss was a sad and complete failure in business. <laughs> he tried his hands at things that would fade. Mrs. Grant moved more often than Carol Reed. <laughs> an event took place that would elevate this man to honor and grace. We hailed our hero and brought him home and put him in the presidency, no more to Rome. <laughs> so successful was he in running the show, the people elected, re-elected him to do it once more. <laughs> in an, then in retirement, our list went back to his losing habits. He made investments where credits never matched his debits. Penniless <laughs> 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 now, he penned his memoir. And Gazook, it turned out he wrote a damn good book. <laughs> 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 so in 1885, when he passed from this life, he had found fortune and a way to end his strife. Too bad, all this, that you didn't know better. Wars only bring glory when he comes with a letter. <laughs> Excellent. The man is now alive who remembers April of 65, when General Grant defeated Lee and kept our Union strong and free. So in spite of his ardent love for booze, <laughs> he got the presidency he couldn't lose. And he beat Governor Seymour of New York and took up cigars, not popping the cork. <laughs> 
Though scandal and fraud were everywhere, old U.S. Grant just hung in there, and in 72 was elected again our Constitution to defend. After he retired, his bank went broke, but he replenished the coffers with a book he wrote. And certainly all of us in this room know exactly who's buried in this. <laughs> it was prayer in the morning, religious hymns at night, and never ever any tobacco or liquor in the White House. A glum. Come is a newcomer in town, and he's law Chester A. Arthur. <laughs> Most of the conventional research, and as best we can tell, his major contribution was to put an elevator in the White House. <laughs> However, we've looked into his life and uh, have come up with the following memory. Should Arthur's sex life was quite fine as a lover of women and wine. He'd have had much, had much more fun at Son of a Gun if he lived in Jack Kennedy's time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the lifestyle of rich and famous, and lo and behold, out comes Chester Arthur. They <laughs> 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 did a piece on the White House and, and back to the when, when Arthur was in there. Hey, no man, no man. Come on. <laughs> He was one to change the furniture around in the White House and had 24 uh, wagon loads of old furniture taken out, and they had that on the uh, lifestyle of the rich and famous. <laughs> when I was born, as anyone's guess, all the records are such a mess. I may have been born across the border. If this is so, I've been out of order. I once helped a woman named Lizzie put a trolley car company into a tizzy. Political cronies I did toss, that's how I became the gentleman's boss. I have reddish brown hair and I'm very tall. I bought all new furniture and had a ball. <laughs> and making changes, I had quite a boldness. That's how I got to know Mr. Otis. Even though I am the commander, doesn't mean you all understand it. Just remember, before I went on this journey, I used to be an attorney. <laughs> this is uh, Chester Allen Arthur. He's the 21st president. And uh, okay, once there was a pres named Chet. He really wasn't faced with a debt. If he were here today, I think he would say, you haven't seen anything yet. But George and Bill and Ross, all working hard to be boss, I think Chet would say, please apply your campaign funds my way, and I'll put a debt in the debt. Oh. <laughs> Arthur. Okay, Chet. Chester Allen Arthur, President 21, came to hold his office after Garfield was shot with a gun. He lived out his term with honesty, responsibility holding his post, surprising his, this nation of people. They liked him about him in post. His policies created surplus for the United States Treasury, but taxes had no reduction for the home of the brave and the free. He voted to have helpful programs to further the cause of each state, but Congress, we know, as Congresses go, were congressionally irate. <laughs> The Congress was split in decision on helping Republican pay, so they slowed down the program, the progress of Arthur, which hindered the president's race. His elegance and demeanor, he sported the fire attire, were not enough to help him to win, and by Jove, he had to retire. <laughs> That's excellent. <laughs>
So thought Grover Cleveland, approaching 50. <laughs> so Francis, barely 21, he went, and he whisked her off to a White House bed. <laughs> With his firm, he was not thrifty. <laughs> he had five children before he turned 60. <laughs> Jim Grover Cleveland? We're going to learn a lot about Grover Cleveland. There was a president named Grover who asked his wife to call him out. Oh, no, 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 Ah. His middle name <laughs> switched over. <laughs> Those lawyers have, aren't subject to reason. <laughs> By Joey Holler. They called him Grover the Good. He tried the best that he could. His first term in office was in 1895. In the election of 89, he took a dive. <laughs> In 1893, his presidency was back alive. <laughs> so are you. I shook hands with Teddy Roosevelt. He came to Batavia where I grew up. Oh. My father lifted me up. He was in the back seat of a big Cadillac. What's <laughs> Was uh, he president then? No, he was at 1912 when he was running for president the second time and lost. What was the name of the party? Bull Moose. Bull Moose. Right. Okay. He asked him for half a million dollars from the Gebbie Foundation. <laughs> His lifetime accomplishments were heady. Cowboy, trust buster, a soldier ready. And with all the big game he caught, who would have thought you'd remember him for a bear called Teddy? Yeah. Of 
first one, I'll read the second one. <laughs> we like it. <laughs> okay, this is Billy Taft. Taft practices craft to the nth degree. And let me tell you, he screwed you and me. <laughs> By urging Congress to pass the income tax, you know very well we all got the... What? Yeah. The what? <laughs> okay, four in the tub, what the heck. I may have to put a disclaimer on this one. <laughs> <Anyway. laughs> okay, Willie and Helen Taft were a sight to be seen. He weighed 325 and she was quite lean. His bathtub fit four and would hold no more. That made it big enough for Clinton and Gore. So <laughs>
Florence did stick by his side. <laughs> the Republicans wanted celebrations and parties. So they put their votes on Warren Harding. Uh, he became president number 29 because the voting public thought he was fine. Uh, and he won by the largest popular vote to that time. He was handsome with a special oratorical flair, but was rumored to have had many an affair. Uh, he married a woman he called the Duchess, and she was the driving force behind his successes. Uh, people thought of him as being very charming, but the pressure of the office were too harming. Uh, the pressures seemed greater the more he tried, and midterm of office, Warren Harding died. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the 30th Pres was Coolidge. He was solemn and not very foolish. To business, <laughs> he was a pal. He reigned in government, silent cow. Brought a boom in the 20s, then quit. Rather mulish. Oh. <laughs> good evening, ladies, and good, good evening, evening chaps. So I welcome, welcome you to our, our presidential rapt. Plymouth Dodge, Vermont, and law clerks of Bird, Councilman and Mayor of the Northampton Bird, House of Representatives of Massachusetts State, its Lieutenant Governor and Governor of Late, as Vice President and the President himself. He says the business of America is business itself. I ask you one, and I ask you all. Who is this president? Does anyone recall? Calvin Coolidge. <laughs> I was born on the 4th of July. I was farming when I was knee high. Here's the end of this rhyme, and I'm not talking fine. No Coolidge, my name is Calvin. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Not to be outdone. <laughs> not to be outdone here. No. My home state is that of a Greek whose party now thinks he's a geek. <laughs> it may not be miraculous, but I was an Amherst Matraculus. When I was president, flappers would give me a peek. <laughs> yeah, right. And as his fourth term started, 
with war yet to decide, this great man died and left us leaving dignity, respect, and pride. <laughs> you can tell, uh, he had Franklin, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, and he writes, Magyars, Romanians, Estonians were sold by an American president so brave and so bold <laughs> to Stalin and Molotov uh, and the KB, KGB. Ooh, ooh. He knew not nor loved true liberty. <laughs> 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 After his trip to Westfield, he, he really got to thinking. There was a little girl there who came to see it all. She was surprised to see that he was so thin and tall. Upon viewing the thinness of Mr. Lincoln's face, a beard, she thought, would be no disgrace. So upon the advice of one little tot, Abe's day of shaving have really gone far. <laughs> Do you suppose this was the connection why Mr. Lincoln won the election? What a terrible shot for the nation and that little tot went on that fateful night President Lincoln was shot. Wow. That was good. Very good. Nice, Joel. A man from Missouri played piano to escape from war. He said he'd do best. It's a hell of a mess, and he dropped the bomb in her. <laughs> <laughs> from a 
selection to term two. <laughs> and Khrushchev got hot about U-2 spy flights, but I refused to apologize so he could still sleep nights. His fatherly image and happy grin took Eisenhower far. Of course, that's before the press knew about the driver of his car. <laughs> From Ike, we got old Tricky Dick. Oh, shit, everybody's loud one. <laughs> Broccoli haters who give the push to re-elect our old George Bush. <laughs> Colored jelly beans were served to Ron while Nancy Bowles orders gown to Don. And Carter's were a frugal pair and lived without big fanfare. Of Jerry Ford, they say it's true. A man can trip over his own shoe. <laughs> As for Richard Nixon, there is no doubt. The tapes will tell you what it's all about. <laughs> LBJ with his beagle hound, strings, ties, and western hats abound. We could go on about the beloved pony, the one with the name of Marconi. But the subject true of raves and rants was a prince among the presidents. <laughs> his name, you'll know, was Eisenhower, a man soon used to positions of power. Supreme Commander seemed his destiny, whether Africa, Europe, or NATO it be, until finally coaxed with much admiration to accept the Republican nomination. Would we like Ike? He's the man we pick, in spite of Will Rock and the surprise Sputnik. <coughs> he was President Dwight David Eisenhower, and the man, it seems, was a virtual tower. What's that you say? A lover named Kay? Don't <laughs> well, ask me. I who wrote with such charms in 52 was too busy rocking three babies in my house. <laughs> yeah. My boat was rammed when I was in the Navy. My wife was Jacqueline Bouvier. By assassination, I did pass away. My name, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Excellent. I can remember exactly what they were doing when they heard the news of Kennedy's death. The man thrust into the vacuum of Kennedy's death was Lyndon Baines Johnson. I will do my best. That is all I can do. One of us, he was sworn in in an airplane. No. You know, that wasn't it? One, I didn't like it. <laughs> and that carried forward, and all I could come up with was uh, the legacy of the Vietnam War, where you might go manage that. Picking up the beagle by the ears. <laughs> I remember all those things. I'm old enough. <coughs> he, he, he was a disaster to me. So I wouldn't take the time. <laughs> I didn't think about him. And you won't hear much about him into the years to come. Exactly. Like the rest of those guys. <laughs> I got that great American Lyndon Baines Johnson. Yeah. LBJ, LBJ, why did you ever go astray? I <laughs> learned from Texas and continued to vex us from Lady Bird in her garden club wanting to plant a flower, a tree, a shrub. <laughs> <laughs> Vietnam and the Great Society were still paying the bills and always will be. LBJ, LBJ, why did you ever go astray? <laughs> On one occasion, Johnson outraged dog lovers throughout the world when he picked up his pet beagle by the ears. I didn't rehearse the... I okay. didn't realize I was... We'll give you a second chance. <laughs> Our 37th president will surely hit and miss. Saved by the bell. <laughs> Elected in 68 to the first moon orbit. Millions protested U.S. involvement in Vietnam. USSR and West Germany signed a friendship treaty for peace once more. In 
1972, he flew to China, and that was certainly something new. Brezhnev and Mr. President signed South One in Moscow, 1972. Due to his popularity and excellence, he was re-elected. However, Watergate burglars yeah. did not go undetected. An entire year passed by, and in 1974, he resigned and was president no more. It must be human nature to remember his mistakes, lies, and despair. Please don't forget a life filled with accomplishment, diplomacy, and foreign affairs. Our president let us down, but we need not be ashamed. Our country held firm while our leaders changed. Remember God commanded us to forgive as he does, without rejection, for we all have sinned, every last one, and Nixon is no exception. <laughs> Very good. See effective at noon tomorrow. Vice President Ford will be sworn in as president at that hour in this office. Solemnly swear. I, Gerald R. Ford, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute. That I will faithfully. Gerald Ford was the nation's first appointed president. Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear that I will... In 1980, Americans wanted a leader who would make them feel good again. Ronald Reagan did just that. He vowed to bring back the spirit of greatness and innocence America had felt before the Vietnam War and the Watergate scandals. Everybody will know who this is. Now, this is a president familiar to all. A fact unfamiliar is hard to recall. Many think for his eight years he was the country's prodigy as great as the Gipper in that famous biography. <laughs> Others might say, and it's kind of a low blow, he was more like his co-star in Bedtime for Bond. <laughs> <laughs> yeah! 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 <laughs> but he harnessed inflation, which we all dread, and embraced Gorbachev, although he was red. <laughs> he fought in war and recession too, and instilled in the country a more positive view. But he left us with a deficit well in the trillions, and those now without homes figure in the millions. His comment on scandal creates a maxim to fear. I know nothing about it. Not the buck stops here. <laughs> it's silly to argue if if he will be thought of as great, but to see more of him is surely our fate. <laughs> if not in political circles advocating not one more tax, maybe on the large screen, at least Cinemax. <laughs>
Only 36 to go. <laughs> Adams, Jackson, Van Buren, Harrison, the winner of Tippecanoe, he stood too long in the cold, wet rain and promptly died of the flu. Somebody else you did, right? <laughs> then Tyler, Polk, and Taylor, the voters' subsequent picks, Fillmore, Pierce, Buchanan, an extremely forgettable six. <laughs> Lincoln and Andrew Johnson, while others impatiently waited, these two entered the history books, impeached and assassinated. <laughs> Grant and Hayes then came along, filling the jobs they had sought, while Samuel Tilden was heard to say that Hayes election was bought. <laughs> Garfield was next in line for the job of leading our century old nation, then Arthur, when Garfield's ticket was punched at Washington's <laughs> Union Station. <laughs> Cleveland took over. Cleveland took over, not once but twice. Then Harrison, known as the man which, laid claim to his modest measure of fame as the ham and the Cleveland sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> McKinley was next and promised to lead a nation which longed to be led. But he shuffled off in Buffalo when he should have stood in bed. <laughs> Our first, Roosevelt, our first Roosevelt then came along, his energy knew no bounds, followed by William Howard Taft, who weighed 300 pounds. <laughs> In 1912, Woodrow Wilson appeared, then Hardy, captain of the decks. He died in Frisco in 23 of too much booze and sex. <laughs> 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 the, next in line, the next in line was Silent Cal, the least loquacious we've had. Sworn into office up in Vermont by a notary public, his dad. <laughs> Hoover fed the Belgian kids, but was only a short time hero. Instead of a chicken in every pot, the Dow Jones fell to zero. <laughs> <laughs> the country was dying of gloom and despair when Roosevelt brought back its life. But he died in warm springs, held in the arms of a woman who wasn't his wife. <laughs> Your history, Harry, do we proclaim. Cahoman helped best cook and bake. But Truman prevailed while Dewey remained a little man on a... Wedding cake, well, all good Democrats know that. <laughs> wedding cake, well, I, I found a place in everyone's heart from Hitler, he said, you're free. Like more than anyone else in his time, except maybe Sarah Lee. <laughs> <laughs> the next two have helped me greatly, the first being JFK, which luckily for an unskilled poet, rhymes well with LBJ. <laughs> now have patience, my long-suffering <laughs> listeners, if any of you are still alive, your faith is at last now rewarded. We've reached the final five. <laughs> Nixon and Ford, Carter and Reagan, and the present incumbent, Bush. Will he stay in the White House for four more years or succumb to Mario's push? <laughs> well, there they are, heroes and bums, forever <laughs> enshrined in fame's hall. Whatever they were, they doubtless reflect the best and worst I do have a four-line epilogue. <laughs> I suppose as follows. So many elections have turned out wrong, it's impossible to list them. Let's throw the electoral college out and try the unit system. <laughs> Bill Clinton served 1993 to the year 2001. And imagine how he's feeling. He, he had four days to prepare for the debate at the Chautauqua Institute. We understand his plans went as, as scheduled there. He did enjoy a little R&R. &R. Beautiful grounds. I mean, how could he not enjoy such such a wonderful time? There he is standing there. We understood this to be a very quick transfer with the president, but it seems to be, he seems to be as he has been since his visit here to Western New York, a, a four-day visit to Western New York, most of them spent at the ship.